So yes. my career path actually started with pediatrics and I loved oh. it. And then moved to England and realized that you know, if I needed a family life and a career, maybe Pete's wasn't for me because I wouldn't leave the hospital. Hello, e-shadowing. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and I am here to have some fun with you today. Um, give me one second as we bring on our guest. Uh, I will bring them on. We have an amazing presentation today to bring to you all about pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Uh, hopefully this is uh, a great presentation for you today. Uh, we will bring on right now, I see. Uh, promote to panelist. Let's bring her on and see. Do, do, do. How's everyone doing? As uh, we get going here, go ahead and let me know where you are watching from. Say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. Hello there. Hi. How are you? I am great. Wonderful. Uh, for myself and for the audience, uh, I know you gave me the phonetic spelling of your name, but I would love to hear it from you. So that I, sure. I don't mess it up. I like getting it, it right. It is a tongue twister. So it's Archna Mishra. Mishra. That's it. Archna Mishra. You got it. That's easy. It just looks scary. All right. <laughs> Um, I love it. Well, Dr. Mishra, thank you so much for joining us today to share your specialty with everyone here. Uh, we got Joseph in Phoenix and Joshua in Sacramento and Jessica in Milwaukee and San Antonio. So, Cal, where in the world are you located, Dr. Mishra? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't realize it was directed at me. <laughs> I, so I'm know. actually in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo. Yes, you do have a buffalo.edu email address. So I could have assumed, um, <laughs> but I didn't want to assume. So you love 12 feet of snow at one time. <laughs> well, it has its own challenges. <laughs> I say Buffalo winter is like childbirth. You know, <laughs> during winters, you want to move out of here, but come spring, come spring, you forget again. all about it. And then you're yeah. like, I forget. Why did I want to move? um yes it's our... a lovely city by the way it's you yeah. know i i've been here 22 years that's the longest i've ever been in a place wow um and uh it's just it's grown on me i came here <laughs> kicking and screaming but um but now i cannot imagine home anywhere but buffalo that is that is amazing uh i often talk about buffalo when i talk to students about building a school list and of where they want to go to medical school. And I often use Buffalo as the example. I'm like, if you're born and raised and bred in Southern California, and you've never seen snow, you probably don't want to apply to Buffalo. <laughs> I would disagree. We have a lot of Californians who come to our school yes. and truly thrive. That is good. That is good. As long as they're okay with that lake effect snow, then uh, that's all right. Dr. Um, Gray, I got to yes. add this, you know, the roads are down to wet pavement. We've got a machinery working to get the snow out. Yeah. So, you know, it is a place to be when it snows. That's good. I, I love the these big machines. And I wonder if Buffalo has them where it like scoops up the snow and then just melts it right right on the thing so you're not plowing it and pushing it around which seems like the most ineffective method ever <laughs> to move snow like pick it up and melt it and like turn it into water where we have water supply shortages everywhere like do something with it <laughs> that's funny so i'm uh Le leslie says uh, i won't complain about early snow in alaska um so um, I'm excited today to talk about uh, a little bit of everything, uh, some pulmonary um, care, some critical care, some sleep medicine. Let's let's talk about your path. So when people hear those terms, right, pulmonary critical care, sleep medicine, for me as a physician and, and talking to lots of physicians through the different channels that I have, well, sleep medicine, you could be a neurologist and do that. 
critical care medicine, you could be a lot of different specialties and do that. Now, pulmonary is, is a little bit more specialized, typically a fellowship after internal medicine. What, what, is, what was your path to get here? So it's interesting because, uh, again, this I'm saying not for you to emulate, but to tell you that it's okay if you don't know where you want to go. So yes. my career path actually started with pediatrics, and I loved oh. it. And then moved to England and realized that, you know, if I needed a family life and a career, maybe Pete's wasn't for me because I wouldn't leave the hospital. So uh, I felt, you know, I wouldn't feel pregnant with every pregnant female. So I switched to OBGYN, loved it while I was doing, and then had an ICU rotation and fell in love with critical care. And that love story has now lasted over a quarter of a century. And wow. um I was, you know, again, I'm ancient, I'm a dinosaur here. So um, when I trained, you could first do internal medicine residency and then get trained in pulmonary critical care and sleep in three years. So I said, hmm, why not? Uh, and in my mind, because I loved critical care, I felt I'll just get boarded in sleep. I'll never do sleep. And lo and behold, you know, 25 years later, every week I have had at least one sleep clinic, if not two, because mm -hmm. sleep is something that you know, I honestly, I feel it's ignored yeah. when we sleep one third of our life sleeping. And there's so many disorders there that we can fix. It's instant gratification. So um, my path was pulmonary critical care and sleep. And I have been practicing all three over wow. the last um, 25 years. So I do ICUs, I do pulmonary consults and outpatient, and I do sleep outpatient as well. Do you think that's less the norm these days. It seems like most people get so subspecialized these days. I, I always joke that the orthopedic surgeon one day is going to be like, I only do left hand pinkies, not right hand pinkies, only left hand pinkies. Do, do you think you're the, the, the abnormal one of the group having kind of three specialties in one? I, you know, again, even in our academic fa um, faculty, many people are just doing sleep. Yeah. Some are just doing pulmonary. There are few who do pulmonary and critical care, but I, you know, there's just, I think, a couple of us who still don't want to give up anything and, you know, want to do all three. And for me, I think it's the best of both worlds because you know with the weeks that I'm in the ICU I have that hype and obviously I have no control over my life those weeks but then yeah. when when I am not in ICU I get a chance to kind of defervesce and um, and really kind of recoup and recover and um, get back on the horse again the next yeah. time that I'm doing critical care. Yeah, I, it, it's funny, as you were saying that there, there was something I recently learned, and I, I wonder if you know this, the phrase, there, there's a phrase out there, a jack of all trades is a master of none. And so someone listening to you talk about how you do all three specialties, well, well, how do you specialize in one? But the thing that I learned recently is that that's not the full phrase, and we, we have shortened it to just that. The full phrase is a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one, right? It, it was a compliment to say that you know a lot about a lot of things and that you don't subspecialize. So um, it, it's a very interesting quote. And I, I think uh, it relates to you to have so much knowledge around all of these things, because as you mentioned, right, the sleep is a very intimate part of of everything that we do and it's kind of funny we i always joke that the hospital is the worst place to get sleep because we're we're rounding at four o'clock in the morning going hey mr smith wake up i need to tell you ask you how you're doing how'd you sleep horrible you woke me up 20 times um so it's kind of funny uh <laughs> I don't know and, what you have. and true. And I think yeah. one of the reason why this discipline fascinates me is because you're really treating the whole person. You know, yeah. a lot of times when you specialize, you actually go into that 
pinky of your left hand analogy, right? Yeah. Because um, you tend to become, you start having tunnel vision. But in reality, you have to treat the person as a whole. And until and unless you do that, um, yeah. you know, you may miss things. And yep. it is, it's just, it gives you a lot of satisfaction not to stop at just the disease process, but really know the person behind the disease. I think yeah. the only reason why I go bright eyed and bushy tail to work is because of that person behind the disease. It's that human connection that brings me not really all the high tech knowledge, which yeah. is fun and everything else, but yeah. But it's really and, that human connection. And and that's what I tell students all the time, even though I don't practice medicine anymore for lots of reasons. Um, uh, my wife is, is a practicing neurologist and obviously all the amazing physicians that I get to interact with. The, I, I get asked a lot by pre-med students is like, is it worth it with so many things changing? I'm like, well, the, everything is always going to change. So no matter what, that's always going to be there. The one thing that doesn't change is that human to human connection, right? The insurance companies can't take that away. They can try to make it shorter, but they can't take it away. So, uh, and if, and that to me is the the core of being uh, a, a physician of, of this career is that connection, even in those, those moments where someone's in the ICU on their deathbed, whatever. Um, it's so important to have that connection there. That's absolutely true. And I so, think, yeah, yeah go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to ask you if you want yeah. me to go into more details about pulmonary critical care and sleep I would medicine love it. and what it entails. I would Can love I it. just share my screen because I ended up making some changes to it? Okay. Yeah, you can share your screen. I, I had it All up right. here, but you can definitely share your screen. All right. Uh, let me see if you have access there. Perfect. So can you I, can see I my love screen, that. Right. Uh, it, it, there it is. I, I love, I love that opening there. <laughs> you know what? I kind of went crazy with photoshopping as you can see, <laughs> I um, love it. but, but I thought this represented the casual conversation that we are planning to have. Perfect. So what I'd like to do again is to talk about what is pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. What are some traits that truly help you thrive in this discipline? And again, I'm not married to these uh, sort of topics. We can always switch if the audience wants something else. And yeah. I'll just let you know who am I to talk about this and why I love this career path. And I'd like to talk a little about gamification and learning, and then we'll solve some cases if that's okay with everyone. Beautiful. All right? I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat, see if there's any relevant questions popping up. Sounds good. So what is pulmonary critical care? What have I learned in my quarter of a century in this discipline? So starting with pulmonary medicine. Pulmonary medicine is really focusing on the lungs and things that affect it. And some of the common diseases that we see include the obstructive lung disease, such as asthma, COPD, um, studying for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, of which emphysema is the most common. Then you have things like bronchiectasis, where people's uh, airways tend to get more dilated. They don't function as well. And then inflammation of the airways. But then you go deeper down, you can have problems with the lung interstitium, the tissue in between the alveoli. And that's a whole um, discipline in itself. You have people who specialize in interstitial lung disease. And then there is that vein of lung cancer, along with other special pulmonary vascular diseases, such as pulmonary hypertension, embolism, um, and then we have this crossover with infectious disease of the different pneumonias, which really took over our life in the last two years, three years now, with COVID pneumonia. Um, along with that, you have uh, centers that have lung transplantation, and then the bread and butter of outpatient medicine are the symptoms that patients come with, such as cough, shortness of breath, coughing up blood. Critical care, on the other hand, um, I'd say it's like medicine on steroids. It's, it really helps you understand the 
pathophysiology of the human body. And the key part in critical care is teamwork. It's the optimal team, including the patient and their family, that leads to great outcomes. So we deal with all types of shock. So it could be, you know, um, the different categories of shock. It could be somebody coming with an organ dysfunction. So if the lungs fail, you have respiratory failure. In terms of heart failing, or people sometimes don't have a separate, what's known as a cardiac care unit. They have an intensive care unit that also deals with people with uh, heart problems. One common thing that we see a lot, I mean, every rotation invariably, every um, uh, you get people with atrial fibrillation, which is their regular heart rate with a rapid ventricular response. You see people with kidney failure. You see people with electrolytes going all crazy, uh, neurological disorders with weakness, needing to respiratory failure, and then the different endocrine disorders. Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the life-threatening disorders, but one that is the easiest for an ICU physician because you get instant gratification. The patients come in almost ready to die, and the next morning you can send them home if you treated them right, right? Yeah. And, and then sometimes we do end up getting complicated post-operative patients that need special care. And then if you're in a trauma ICU, um, you obviously deal with people who have um, suffered injuries that are critical. And then comes sleep medicine. Like I said, you know, sleep is tired of being treated as the last uh, thing that you think of. And in reality, even in the ICU, there's so many times that we see a patient who is delirious. The more delirious you are, worst outcomes. And it could be because, as you said, we wake our patients up multiple times, right? On the floors, there's sometimes no reason for the silly method of using vitals every four hours or doing blood work on patients at like 3 a.m. in the morning. So it is important that we change these practices because sleep is important for healing and sleep is important for your survival. You know, you don't sleep for two weeks and you're dead. So yeah. there are, um, there's reason to focus on it. And things that we see is, you know, as a pulmonologist, I'm most comfortable with sleep apnea where you stop your breathing or um, you know slow down your breathing so it could be obstructive where the back of your throat closes up and you cannot breathe but it could be central where your brain says don't breathe so it is there are different ways um, that you know, sleep deprivation manifests. There's also um, things like REM behavior disorder, where people normally during dream sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, our muscles don't work for a reason, so that we don't act out our dreams. And some people lose that atonia during REM and can actually hurt themselves and their partners. Uh, <laughs> people have committed crimes during that. And, um, and it's been, you know, it, it's something which we see pretty often, and especially in the veteran population, because I'm working at the VA for the last seven years, traumatic brain injuries leading to different sleep disorders. And then we have our narcoleptics who are satisfying to treat. There's a patient of mine whose narcolepsy, which essentially is the dream sleep coming and attacking you when you are awake. And they may have cataplexy where they suddenly lose all muscle tone. And the trigger can be different. So this patient of mine, actually, his trigger is laughter. So he can never watch Seinfeld. Every time he watches the show, he gets a cataplectic attack. Wow. I, I love the cataplectic goats. That's my favorite thing on the internet is when the goats get all excited and they just fall over. 
And there is um, you know, other things like restless leg syndrome, which is an annoyance more than anything else. Um, so it's, again, because especially with sleep apnea, even in the sleep lab, if you are starting them with obstructive sleep apnea on uh, you know, uh, CPAP therapy, which is continuous positive airway pressure, all you're doing is air splinting the back of their throat, you can suddenly see, even in the sleep lab, a dramatic difference, you know, all the arrhythmias that you saw, all the oxygen levels dropping while they were not on CPAP, all are gone once you start CPAP. So that instant gratification is thrilling. So sleep medicine is my sort of go-to to relax. So coming, any questions on any of those three? I don't see any questions yet, although Alondra says, uh, I'm a phlebotomist at a hospital, and unfortunately, we have to wake patients up at 2 a.m. when oh, most of the time they're just falling asleep. Like, to me, that's just, that's criminal. Absolutely. Uh, I think that culture needs to change. So yeah. please, as a phlebotomist, raise your voice and, and make sure that you know, we physicians don't order such unearthly labs. There's no reason why everybody should be woken up to get their labs so early in the morning. Uh, uh, yeah. So getting back to traits that help you thrive, the first thing I want to stress is that it is important that the profession that you all are going into, you realize that it's not about fixing your patients because then you assume they're broken. It's not even about helping because then you assume you're above them. It's about service. It's about being at the same level and getting as much from that interaction as you give to it. And that's basically is what this profession is about. Um, and the next thing is to be comfortable with decisions in the face of uncertainty. What do I mean by uncertainty? You know, definition of uncertainty is that subjective experience of not knowing. It's that internal feeling. It's a recognition of the ignorance. Mm. It's like enlightened ignorance. And uncertainty in healthcare is rampant. You know, whether a patient has or will develop a particular condition, how will that condition involve? What extent will the treatment be beneficial? And whether the patient is really receiving the right care in the right place, in the right time, with the right people? And am I the right person to be providing the care? And, you know, to add fuel to the fire, there is this imposter phenomenon. So uncertainty is a place where you know, where there is confusion, where there's overwhelm, the errors are made, but it is also the place where the best of medicine is co-created. So when we become steeped in this uncertain world of unknown and really have that shared mental model with our patients, that uncertainty is not negative. It's not an elephant to be caged. It's what helps you thrive. And it is critical that you deal with this uncertainty and don't let it hijack your emotions. Don't let it control you. And just work into bringing your best self. Consider it an opportunity. And believe me, you know, like I mentioned to you before, having spent most of my adult life globe trotting, switching disciplines, I always felt I had to work harder to prove myself. But it is important that you understand and have that tolerance for uncertainty and that curiosity for unknown. And, you know, I love to challenge my learners to think about what does not fit into the diagnosis that they've bestowed on the patient. And always remember the uniqueness of the individual. Uh, can I share a story about a patient, if that's okay, just propped into my mind? I would mind? love it. I would love so it. So there was this patient who got admitted with um, asthma exacerbation. And then when I go and examine the patient, um, all I can hear is wheezing only localized to the lower quadrant of the right lung. So it, it's not diffuse wheezing. And, um, and then I go back and, you know, everybody seems to have a CT scan always whenever they come 
to ER with shortness of breath, and so did she. And looking at the CT, although it wasn't reported by the uh, radiologist, I saw there was a little shadow there in the uh, bronchus intermediate. So that's kind of the uh, right side bronchus going into the lower lung that splits into um, you know right middle lobe and right lower lobe. Um, so then I went back and asked the patient, I should have done this before, but it was the image that triggered me to ask her. I said, when did you start hearing this wheezing or that noisy breathing? She looked back and said, hmm, I was actually watching the Bills game and having chicken wings, and I choked on the chicken wings. And that was when I started coughing, and then since then I have been wheezing. So in reality, this was not an asthma exacerbation. This was a piece of chicken wings that I spent my Saturday fishing out from the lung wow. with a bronchoscope because that, that's <laughs> what was leading to her wheezing. So as soon wow. as we took out the chicken wings, she was, you know, fine and ready to go home. So it really is, it is that uh, ability to question and not make everybody fit into that little box, you know, of it being just an asthma exacerbation. So be excited by complex reasoning. And crave for that continuity of care and being a lifelong learner. Also, don't be intimidated by procedures because both pulmonary and critical care, there are plenty of procedures. So you're somebody who loves to work with your hands, you'll get plenty of opportunity putting in central lines, doing a bronchoscopy, taking fluid out from the lung, you name it, and there is a procedure that you can do. You need to have fun educating, not just your patients, but also your colleagues. And that's something that, you know, especially because with critical care, the whole presentation is so complex and unique, you'll have plenty of opportunity to educate. And like I said before, get to know the person behind the disease. You know, there was this patient who was presented to me. He came with, I, I won't go into the details, but um, he, when I went to examine him, he had a whole tesseract tattoo at the back of his, uh, you know, on his torso. And nobody who presented the case to me even mentioned that. Wow. And I mean, that was huge. It, it really, and then finding out later from him about all the, things that he had discovered and he was he was somebody who discovered ways to um, uh, you know use ultrasound in different ways so uh, so get to know your patients that's where the fun of medicine is don't focus on your eye patient that won't give you the joy of your life what will is the human connection also <laughs> the, the COVID pandemic has taught us how to think creatively in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. But that's what you are getting into in this profession. And learn to thrive in it. Don't be intimidated by it. And one of the things that has helped me in this profession is this is something which you know, I saw it in conscious leadership. There is a link to the video there, but it's about every time, every moment of the day, locate yourself. You know, ask yourself, am I below the line or am I above the line? We are all geared to be below the line, where we are closed, we are defensive, we are committed to being right. But rise above the line, be open, be curious, and be committed to learning. And that's what will help you thrive in this profession, um, because that's where the fun is. Being right is truly not fun. And again, I think I've talked to you about what I do, but, you know, the key is to have that balancing act of not just being a physician or an educator or a researcher, but also balancing it with your personal life, you know, being a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend, a, you know, a philanthropist, because, and have realistic expectation to this goal, because it is true balance that will give you uh, the genuine joy 
and there may be something that can cause you intolerable angst, but our reality is created by our thoughts. And it is important that you realize you're more powerful than you think you are. And I, I feel that, you know, at every juncture in my career, um, I was satisfied with what I was doing, but felt compelled to make a change to find a better balance in each of my roles. And in that process, I've let go of many goals only to create new ones, right? And remember I think, what- Yeah, I, I think that is one of the biggest, um, I think life lessons and future doctor lessons that I've been trying to talk more and more about is that intentionality around who are you as a person? What are your goals today? Not what were they 10 years ago? And are you enjoying what you're doing? And if not, change it. Uh, and that's okay. I couldn't agree more, um, Ryan. I know research had always fascinated me. I was even as crazy to do a master's in clinical research methodology the same time that I was doing my fellowship in pulmonary critical care. <laughs> I was sleep deprived for two years. And, you know, this was in New York City. So I was doing my fellowship in North Shore in Manhasset. Mm -hmm. And I was doing my master's at Albert Einstein in Bronx. Oh, wow. Anybody who knows New York City, all I remember of the two years is the traffic. That's I've a long ways everything away. everything I learned. And then when my daughter was born, you know, research didn't fascinate me as much. I've gone back to it now, now that she's 19 and is a, um, is a junior in uh, Georgetown. Um, but, but again, so your priorities change. And it is important that you see what is it that I cannot live without? What are my touchstones? What are things that truly bring me joy? And remember that at every juncture, I don't know if uh, you know, how many of you read Stephen Covey's uh, jar of life experiment where he gives you big rocks, little pebbles and sand. If you fill your jar with sand or minutia, you'll not have space for this big rock. So it is important that you reflect and make time for things that matter because then the little rocks and sand will fit in beautifully. Yep. So yeah. that's something that, you know, I feel um, is is something to keep in mind. But in a nutshell, I'm a happy and fulfilled individual because I have something to do, something to love and something to hope for. So that's that's sort of me. But as a teacher, I've always dreaded having a student like the adorable Charlie Brown in my lectures. I was always afraid that those lectures that I worked so hard on preparing would be heard merely as trombone noises booming <laughs> over the heads of my students, you know, in through one year and out through the other. And I realized that the fault didn't lie in the student. It was really because learning is never boring, right? Yeah. But it's really the way the material is presented. And doctor originates from the Latin word docio, right, to teach. So it is important that we get good at it. And, and it's been gratifying to see, um, you know, to be recognized for the teaching. That's something that I, um, I, you know, I felt like a fraud when I got this uh, American Medical Student Association Award as Women Leaders in Medicine, because I realized that up till then, I was really focusing more on the knowledge base. Like, you know, I love doing the chest x-rays and even talking about rheumatology and other things, serving as associate clerkship director uh, at that time. But now, um, but, but then really it is about connecting with your students and knowing the person behind that student. I hope, you know, to now become more like this peanut comic where, um, where um, you know, Peppermint Patty says to Charlie Brown, you know, I wonder what the teacher makes to which Charlie Brown says a difference, Peppermint Patty, they make a difference. So um, that's sort of the direction that I've gone in. And one of the things that I've adapted is gamification. And gamification is really sometimes crazily overtaken a lot of my teaching. It's playing games in the non-game context. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, 
you know, that's something which is stimulating, motivating, entertaining. And I'll show you just even teaching. I don't know how if, if that comes through. Um, so instead of just teaching people how to intubate, we, we do a simulation where we pitch one resident against another. And while their colleagues are cheering them on and they have to intubate and I mean, the key to this is to get people really involved. But what is also important to have a psychologically safe environment where, where they are able to uh, not feel threatened about failing. And personally, I'm fascinated by this concept of vertical learning because you know, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And this is so true in this day and world where knowledge is everywhere. It's just a click away. It's yep. about being that role model and inspiring people to be lifelong learners and to not just stick with the technical or the head being involved, but really having the head, heart and hand involved. I also feel, um, you know, gamification allows us to emphasize that human dimension, you know, the caring to get learners to be self-directed. And, you know, the foundational knowledge is important, the application is important, but what is really more important is making connection between the learned material and real life and the caring. And that's something which is a pleasure to observe as I, you know, delve in the different games. So I've used anything and everything to gamify and teach medical concepts, you know, starting with the paper planes and snowball, where during the lecture, I would give them sheets of paper and they would then quiz, write down questions as I'm teaching. And then I would give them breaks and they could either create snowballs or paper airplanes and throw it to different teams. And then they would quiz each other to now being really into creating escape rooms. I think I'm having more fun creating escape rooms than, than anything else. And that's something which uh, you know, which really um, leads to learner engagement. I've seen that people retain more knowledge that way. And above all, it's really seeing the soft skills, the leadership, the followership, the ability to connect and communicate and have fun. Um, so everybody can benefit from this. It's both learners, educators, and eventually patients. Because if you learn in a psychologically safe environment, you're more likely to retain that information. And I think the curiosity, the happiness, the intrigue, excitement, all works into making us better physicians. And um, so, you know, let's talk about escape room. That's when I get super excited. So I'm sorry. I speak fast and I start speaking faster when talking about escape room. So essentially, you all know what's an escape room, right? Most people have played that, but sort of in a non-medical environment. So we create props and puzzles. And, um, and that even helps me as I'm watching them play through this to see who's the person who needs more help? Who's the person who needs to develop more soft skills? Who's the one? And, and that's really fun. And, um, you know, it can be an in-person escape room. It can be an escape room in a box. It can be a virtual escape room. I was this close to creating a virtual escape room for you, but then I didn't know what was your foundational knowledge base. So I kind of, you know, moved away from that. I'll just show you a quick uh, clip of an escape room um, that this was one of the older escape rooms, which was on an ACLS base team. So they had to really figure out the different uh, arrhythmias um, and sort of connect with this. Plus they had a patient who was deaf, whose name was Donald Ghana Cord, and they would have to create, you know, use thumbs up, thumbs down, like a direction with sign language. And that's the sound that gets me most excited is the fun <laughs> and the joy. And I think Einstein would have agreed because his one of his quotes was creativity is intelligence having fun. Yeah. So, um, and again, numerous props and it's 
It's so much fun creating these escape rooms. If any of you haven't delved into it, go ahead, create escape rooms for your colleagues. It's not expensive. All you need is, you know, um, that curiosity. It'll help you learn and maybe help your colleagues learn too. Well, I, uh, I, I may I may have to uh, curbside you at some point because we're putting on our first in-person conference next year um, in in Baltimore. And I think an escape room may be very fun to uh, to put on there. Sorry for that evil laughter That's in the okay. background, but it is it was one of the escape rooms that I recently did on respiratory, um, you know, um, uh, respiratory distress, and uh, it 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 was. Um, you know, little things like using a mirror image of the case history and then creating, uh, like, for example, this was like a fake receipt I created because the clue was in the dictionary and dictionary was one of the items there. Um, again, matching, using emojis. It, it's tons of fun. And uh, this was what my daughter helped me create. This was a virtual escape room and I can definitely share the link to it. Again, I'll share it with you if you want to share it with people to play. This is my, you can see I'm really impressed by Einstein because my <laughs> dog's name is Einstein and this was to help him escape. And this is an escape room that that teaches you how to create an escape room. Wow. So, um, so that was it. So let's go through some cases if that's okay. Let's it's do it. not an escape room, but let's quickly go through some cases. And, and again, I know that just talking about cases may make you anxious and increase your oxygen needs. So before we do that, let's all take a deep breath because that's what, all right. And that's what really helps trigger your parasympathetic nervous system so that your sympathetic nervous system of fight and flight doesn't hijack you. All right. So you ready? How can we get the audience to respond, um, Ryan? Is it through uh, through chat? Yeah, so they can um, they can go through chat or they can, if we want, we can have them raise their hand if they want to talk to us, talk with us. I lost you. Come back. Who died? Me or her? Me or her? Am I still here? Hello, hello. Her. Okay. All right. We'll give her a second to come back. <laughs> she she failed the escape room. She is stuck. <laughs> come back. All right. She'll be back in a second. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe um, we'll we'll get her back. Um, there she is. She's back. Hello. Sorry, I I just ended up losing you for a second, and we, I got out. <laughs> we we all assumed you failed the escape room and and you lost. <laughs> oh, <laughs> here we go. Let's. Um, so, um, they can either just answer in chat or, um, or come on if you want to ask follow-up questions. What, what would you prefer? Either way. Okay. I, I'm, whatever works for you works for me. Okay. All right. Let's, so, let's keep with chat. That's the easiest. All right. Perfect. So you call to evaluate a 70 year old gentleman who is in respiratory distress. So his respiratory rate is 38, which is pretty high. So you're breathing at 38 per minute, which you cannot sustain for long. Uh, he's also got a rapid heart rate. His blood pressure is fine. He doesn't have a fever, but his oxygenation on room air is really low, which is 84%. And then I have a figure there given to you. What do you think you expect to find just based on that image and the history that I have given you? What do you expect to find on examination? So Diana uh, is jumping to diagnoses. What do you find? What do you find? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? All right, let's start with a good history and physical people. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tressie says he's wheezing. Yep, you're absolutely correct. What made you think that? What in that image caused you to 
Um, and I see, I actually opened up the chat, beautiful. He's leaning forward and having that tripod position. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, is he pale? Mm, maybe a stretch, but okay. Or asking about shortness of breath, shoulders very high, wonderful. This is an awesome crowd. Are you sure you are pre-meds? They're getting smarter and smarter. Look at that. Neck muscles <laughs> are strained. They may be assisting in breathing. Wow. All right. Give it to you. And I think, again, welcome to University oh. of Buffalo. Um, <laughs> you, you all, um, you all definitely have the right frame of mind. So oh, Linda's see. cheating. She's already a physical therapist. She knows. Ah. She knows. <laughs> you know what, Linda? But having that background is going to give you an edge. Exactly. So, so that's, you know, that truly is awesome, Sarah. I think, again, I agree with you. Um, all right. And uh, Diana, again, um, you know, again, welcome to U.S. And U.S. medical schools are really fun and they teach you stuff. So let me walk you through with some things that you may find. And as you diagnose correctly, this gentleman did have emphysema. So when you see somebody with emphysema, it's important to see those hollow supraclavicular fossae here. You see these, they're almost like cup holders. The intercostal muscles become really prominent. And if you see them breathe, they'll be doing that purse lip breathing so that the airways don't collapse. You yeah. see barrel chest there. You may see a very prominent, uh, you know, sternal angle. That's yeah. There. Can I, can I pause one second? The purse sure. lips on exhalation. I want to see if anyone knows what they're doing. They're, they're doing what we do uh, through intervention. Sometimes does anyone know what that's causing? What's that causing? Anyone, anyone, anyone who works on vents helps to excel more. Mm. Okay. Build well, a in a way, not wrong, yeah. because if you keep your alveoli open, you're more likely to exhale more, right? Yeah. Mm. And yeah. Next trend. Maybe, maybe. I think the magic answer that Dr. Gray is looking for starts with a P. <laughs> and ends with a P. <laughs> right. they're, peeping, they're peeping themselves, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. it's the positive and expiratory pressure. One way to think of it is almost like, say, you are blowing up a balloon, right? It's harder to blow up the balloon initially, and then it gets easier, and then it gets harder again, right? So in order to blow up the balloon a little bit so that the work of breathing is easier would be one way to think of it. And then when you go to medical school, you're going to learn about, you know, the equal pressure point and all that fun stuff that happens. But for now, that peep is a good thing to remember. Also, when you look at them, you know, some of you notice that tripod position. So go a little further and look for that doll sign because these people who have severe emphysema may have hyperpigmentation or bruising caused by that tenting of the hands and elbows. And, and again, sometimes you may have paradoxical movement of the chest. So I'm going to show you a little um, video that shows that. See how the person is pulling in the muscle of the abdomen when they are breathing in. And, and that's an ominous sign that tells you that they need help. I'm going to go back a slide. I'm sure, have you all heard wheezing? If not, here is a sample. All right, so, um, and now you have more data available. And I don't know how familiar you're on uh, arterial blood gas results, but if you look at this, the pH is low, the PCO2, the carbon dioxide is really high, and the bicarb is high, that's telling you that this is happening chronically, and the oxygen level is low. So if you are below 60, you're in that slippery slope, 
um, where you can really desaturate fast. And again, because hemoglobin carries the oxygen, if you are chronically deprived of oxygen, you may end up getting a high hemoglobin. And if you do a chest x-ray on them, you see this hyperinflation and you see that they have an increased AP diameter and um, their diaphragms all flat. So those are some findings that, you know, that you're going to see on imaging, right? So now if you have this person whose oxygen level is really that low, will you take a more complete history as Dr. Gray said, which is really important, 80% of diagnosis is history, or will you do something else? So the oxygen level is 84. Help me, help me here. Help My patient me. is turning blue. <laughs> more history or take action? What are we going to do? I think, I think action, action, oh, well, action. There we wonderful. go. Wonderful. <laughs> and that's basically it. You really want to, you know, treat them acutely. So the what now? And then you can go to, you know, so what? And get the whole differential diagnosis. I thought at quickly go over oxygen therapy with you because that's something which it, do we have time for it if i go to over this in like two three minutes i don't have a hard stop so you're you're okay okay are do you all want to learn about oxygen therapy yes right. please they say. thank you for that yes <laughs> please so with oxygen therapy it can be a low flow system or a high flow method right is any oxygen below 95 Mm, not really. There is more literature showing that more than 94 may be harmful in some cases. So the for somebody with COPD, 88 to 92 is that sweet spot. For others, above 90 is when you're not at the slippery slope where the oxygen dissociates with the hemoglobin and you get a, a low level. So the first thing you do, which most of you have seen, is putting in this nasal cannula of oxygen. Always remember that when you connect a patient to the nasal cannula, you connect it with the one that is the green on the wall, because there's one of these that is a yellow colored one, and that's room air. So whenever you're attaching them, attach it to the green and that'll give you 100% oxygen that is coming through the nasal cannula. And then you set it. You set it at two liters per minute, say at two liters per minute, the two liters that's coming from the wall is 100% oxygen. But if your minute ventilation, which is your respiratory rate by the tidal volume is six liters, then the rest of the four liters is 21%, which is the oxygen in the environment. But on the other hand, if your minute ventilation is 15 liters, then two liters is the 100% oxygen, and the rest of the 13 liters is the ambient 21% oxygen. Keep that as mind, because a lot of times people, you know, see that, oh, two liters means 34% oxygen. Not correct. It depends on your minute ventilation. And sometimes when people need to conserve oxygen and they are, you know, they are carrying these oxygen cylinders with them, they can have these little reservoirs that are there. You can have one which is an oximizer, which is like a thick cannula near the nose, or you can have these pendants. And these pendants of uh, store oxygen so that it is easier for the person to breathe. I see a question. Also, if high flow won't sustain the patient, do they have a DNR, DNI in place if they have had that condition for a while? That depends on the patient's choice. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, that you have to honor the patient's choice. And that decision should be made way before they land in the ICU where they are about to need the mechanical ventilation. That should be done in concert with their loved ones, and they should have something known as a healthcare proxy who knows their decisions if they have not explicitly stated it. And um, again, giving them high flow oxygen or sometimes even giving them non-invasive ventilation is uh, fine. And you said uh, the other question Elizabeth had is hypoxic stimulus to drive. Is that why we maintain 88 to 92 percent? Hmm. Now you're making me go a little deeper into it. So, well, hypoxic drive, yes, but that's the old theory. 
the new theory is that when you give too much oxygen, what happens to the blood vessels in the lung? Normally, when there's hypoxia, the blood vessels constrict. So you have what's known as hypoxic vasoconstriction, so that the blood can go to the areas of the lung that are well ventilated. And then you give them too much oxygen, the areas that are not well ventilated will also, the blood vessels will dilate. So there'll be wasted blood flow to that area. Another thing that happens is, you know, there's nitrogen in the air for a reason, right? The nitrogen in the air keeps your alveoli open. If you replace, because nitrogen doesn't get absorbed by the blood. On the other hand, if you give them oxygen, that will move from the alveoli to the blood, so your alveoli will collapse. And that will lead to more CO2 building up because there's no ventilation occurring there. And another reason could be what's known as a Haldane effect, which is if hemoglobin is given the choice to hang on to oxygen or to CO2, it'll like the oxygen more and it'll leave the CO2 behind. So if you give too much oxygen, there are many reasons other than the hypoxic increase in your respiratory rate and tidal volume that leads people to start retaining CO2. All right, I hope that explains it. It was a long-winded response, but you know, I love lungs and I love the physiology behind it. So here you go. Um, so getting back to the uh, low flow oxygen. So say the person's saturation doesn't improve, you go up to, to four liters, they are still at 86%. You go up to six liters, they're still 87% you have to move to a different method of giving oxygen. Because if you're ever in the hospital, you put in the nasal cannula and crank it up to 10 liters, believe me, the, you'll never put it on your patient again because it burns. Oxygen dries up your nasal passages and it burns. So if you're going above six liters, quit that and use some other device. So the next device you can use is a venturi mask or a venti mask. This really, instead of just giving you two liters, three liters, four liters, it, it gives you percent oxygen. And they have little holes there that drag in the rest of your ventilation. So you can get you know, 35%, 50% oxygen based on um, the valve that you put there. A newer method of giving it rather than the venti mask is such a boon to us. It's known as an oxy mask. And what is nice about this is it's an open mask. You see there are holes in it so that it's not like a vomit reservoir. Um, it's also got holes in it so people can talk. It's got holes in it so you can they can sip and drink with a straw. And it's got this novel technology, the diffuser technology that helps concentrate and redirect the flow of oxygen. So you can even get to up to 80, 90% oxygen with an oxy mask. So that's been a development in the last decade, which is awesome. Now, I'm sure you all have seen what's known as a non-rebreather mask. That's a little plastic bag there that you fill up with oxygen and that serves as a reservoir. So every time the person breathes, there's a little flap here that opens up and the oxygen comes from that reservoir. Very, very important. If you're in a hospital setting and you see somebody slap on a non rebreather mask on a patient's face without first inflating this bag, they, it's almost like putting in a plastic bag on top of your patient's face uh, because they can breathe. That's where the reservoir is. So always fill up that bag before you put it on the patient's face, all right? So that's another method. Now say even that fails. So the next step would be high flow. And what does high flow do? It gives you all, you know, up to 60 liters per minute of whatever concentration you want to give. You want to give 100%, go ahead. It's 100% going at 60 liters per minute. So even if your minute ventilation is you know, 30 liters per minute, it can still keep up with it instead of the low flow system where you cannot 
you know, you cannot go beyond that uh, level of liters per minute. What's also nice is that it's moistened, it's warm, and it also gives you that magical peep that Dr. Gray was talking about because it's giving, you know, it's pushing air under pressure. So it is important that you, um, you know, that, uh, that if your patient is hypoxic, despite low flow systems that you go to a high flow. Yes, you're correct. 100% oxygen is lethal to the body. Part of the reason is because it, it, it um, secretes these free oxygen radicals and can damage the alveoli. But remember, lack of oxygen is also bad for your brains, right? So if you're really hypoxic, you need to you need to make sure that you, um, you know, oxygenate the brain. All right. So moving on, if the problem is ventilation, not just oxygenation. So it's not just that the oxygen level is low, but the CO2 is high as well. You can try non-invasive ventilation. Non-invasive means that you don't have a tube down the patient's throat. Instead, you're using a mask to push air into the lung. And, and that's, you know, that's the non-invasive part of it that helps drive off the CO2. And if non-invasive positive pressure ventilation fails, mechanical ventilation is there. And to be honest, I'll tell you what really led me to go into critical care was the fun I had playing with ventilators. They are tons of fun. So, um, you know, if you go into that discipline or even during residency um, or medical school, always use an opportunity to rotate in the ICU so that you can see how amazing these, uh, you know, devices are. Um, okay, so takeaways from the respiratory case, be mindful, you know, take a deep breath take care of your anxiety, recognize the signs and symptoms. Respiratory failure is a syndrome where the lung is failing. Always make sure you maintain a patent airway, treat the hypoxia. Remember oxygen is a drug, so prescribe it you know, uh, accordingly. If it doesn't improve with nasal cannula, just don't keep cranking up the liters. Always, always um, uh, try changing the device. All right, um, I have other cases, but we can stop here if you like. Yeah, let's stop uh, and maybe take, just do a couple minutes. Maybe if someone has a question, we can take a couple live questions if, if you're okay with that. Sounds great. All right, so let me look at who has their hands raised. Julia's has her hand raised. Hello, Julia. Unmute yourself if you're still there, still want to talk. If not, I can bump you. Um, for anyone else, if you want to come on, ask a question, just raise your hand using Zoom's little raise hand feature. We can bring you on. I guess and Julia. while others are coming up, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind comments. It means the world to me. Yeah. Well, no one's raising their hands, so I guess, uh, oh. Uh, we'll bring Diana on, who uh, says she was in medical school before. Sounds like maybe in another country. Now came here and hello there. Hi there. Thank you so much, Dr. Gray and Dr. Mishra, for today's presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I had a question regarding a part of your presentation. I noticed that there was um, anxiety written as something that could affect um somebody's uh, um you know breathing how how specifically because i'm very curious as to what gets affected so one of the things with anxiety what do you tend to do you hyperventilate right that's what you do what does that do it drives off the carbon dioxide then you drive off the carbon dioxide what does that do to your brain it tells you hey stop breathing right? That's one of the symptoms. The other thing that happens is you become alkalemic. And when you become alkalemic, the hemoglobin actually hangs on to the oxygen. It does not release it. So when you are acidemic, the hemoglobin releases the oxygen to the tissue. When you are alkalemic, you, it hangs on to the oxygen, making you more, going to more of an anaerobic metabolism. So 
hyperventilation and anxiety um, can be, um, you know, can be a problem. Does that answer your question, Diana? Yes, yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Good question. Take one more, Anastasia. Hi, um, I joined a little bit late, so I hope you didn't already answer this, but I saw that you also did some research in sleep medicine. Um, did you want to talk about that just a little bit? Because I think it's really interesting. What, right. what part of it? <laughs> I don't really know because I don't know much about it. <laughs> if you just want to give like a general, like what in, in particular did you study when you did it? So with sleep medicine, again, uh, I don't know if you're talking about the topic of sleep medicine or the research. So research in sleep medicine, the last one I did, we published a paper about um, the impact of sleep uh, in COVID-19. I worked in the past in, in um, you know, looking at uh, impact of obstructive sleep apnea on um, uh, quality of life. And, and uh, also did a study on dry mouth and using hyaluronic acid as a method of moistening. But I think more than anything, do you want to know what sleep medicine is? I did go over it before, but it's really emphasizing the value of sleep and looking at disorders, which could be breathing disorders like sleep disordered breathing, like obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, looking at other disorders like narcolepsy, other circadian rhythm disorders such as delayed sleep pace syndrome where people cannot fall asleep until too late at night, or you know, people who wake up early in the morning, people who have insomnia, people who have restless legs, or it's it's just it's a fun field um, that is, uh, you know, that where you get instant gratification, I say. You can see your patients get better. You know, the insomniac who now can sleep is much better. I sometimes feel like a marriage counselor with sleep medicine because people who've been in separate bedroom for years, you treat their sleep apnea and they are back together. You know, it's, um, it's just, um, it's a great discipline. Okay, awesome. awesome. Thank you. Well, Dr. Mistress, thank, thank you so much for joining us today, taking some time out of your busy schedule to, to inform and educate and uh, entertain. I think people loved uh, the discussion, and I'm definitely going to reach out um, ab about escape rooms because I think that would be fun to have at our, our first in-person conference next year. So uh, thank you again, and hopefully we'll have some future uh, sleep medicine, poem, critical care docs here uh, in the future. That is great. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to people who will be taking care of me because as I told you, I'm a dinosaur. And, um, <laughs> the, you know, as you get older, the closer you are to needing help. Yes. So thank you again. And um, count you know, count me in when it comes to creating an escape room for your in-person Love it. Love um, it. meeting. All right. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone coming, hanging out. Uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.